All right, welcome to Bet the Edge, Las Vegas Hotel Room Edition again. Uh, I'm Jay Crouch, joined by Drew Dinsick. Drew, you're in Portland, Oregon. Is that right? Yes, beautiful Northwest. Watching um, poor Felix Algier Aliassim get just truck sticked by uh, Daniel Medvedev so far. I thought this was going to be a competitive tennis match, but it is not so, to this point. Uh, you know, the Doha, uh, you know, is just an has been an unbelievable field today. Although I don't give uh, the dog much of a chance here in the uh, in the later match and the wind there is just whipping around. So, uh, so far, my morning of uh, sitting back and enjoying some tennis has been a little bit a uh, uh, little bit waylaid. Uh, although I will tell you, if you are watching tennis this week, you know about the grand return of young Carlos Alcaraz. Holy smokes. He's back. He looks good. Uh, he's playing Buenos Aires. He's got a, a moderate test today. I'm not going to say it's a, he, you know, Lajovic has a realistic shot to beat him, but um, spent a lot of collecting data on some guys who are coming back off of long layoffs who didn't really play well in the uh, Australian swing. So uh, enjoying some tennis right now. Yeah, Yannick Sinner as well yesterday, looking like the third best player in the world. Man. He, uh, I was talking to a friend about Sinner and his futures prices. Like, he sh- I didn't think he should be double digits for any Grand Slam going forward. Like, he's just there's too much upside. He's too good. Um, and yeah, I I just think that he will he will win a Grand Slam at some point over the next two years. I would think there's just too much talent there, um, particularly after what he showed. Uh, at the U.S. Open and, and the epic match he played against Alcaraz. Uh, today, we're going to change it up a little bit. We're going to talk uh, a lot of college basketball with March Madness approaching. Uh, we're going to welcome in Eamon Brennan of The Athletic, talk about strongest and weakest of the national title contenders. We'll hit Duke, North Carolina, and Kentucky, whether they can turn it around. And then we'll preview some of the biggest games uh, on Saturday. So let's welcome in Eamon now. Eamon, thanks for joining us, man. Um, hey, guys. Let's uh, jump straight in and talk about who you think the strongest title contenders are among the top eight seeds. I mean, I think you start at the top with Houston. They're the one team right now um, that you look up and down in terms of, you know, their numbers on both ends of the floor, right, but also um, sort of the the makeup of their team. It's a pretty veteran team with one really good freshman in, in Jarius Walker, whereas you, know, you kind of look at Alabama, it's a, a more freshman-led team. Um, when you're talking about performance in the tournament, I think that that matters a lot. Houston is the team that has the makeup from top to bottom. Um, great defensively, good shot selection, like good modern shot selection. Gets a ton of offensive rebounds, so they have a sustainable sort of path for more possessions in the NCAA tournament. Um Senior leadership, a star guard in Marcus Sasser, who's played in tournaments before, um, had a long career now by this point. Uh, there, Houston is the team that is just like last year. Um, after Marcus Sasser got hurt, uh, he had a bad injury in the middle of the season. I think everybody kind of got off Houston a lot, and they kind of quietly went through their league season. And I think people who are really paying close attention to them were like, oh, man, Houston's looking ominous here. Look at Houston's numbers. Like, they're crushing people. Um, and then by the time they got to the tournament – uh, and, and played really good teams and beat really good teams. I think the Illinois game, I, I remember predicting that they were going to beat Illinois probably pretty badly. And a lot of Illinois fans got mad at me like, oh, Houston, what if they <laughs> what if they played in the Big Ten? You know, they'd have eight losses, ten losses, whatever. And then they absolutely destroyed Illinois. Um, it's just a really good team, a really good program. A coach who's been there before made deep tournament runs. I think it's an obvious answer, right? It, there's not like a ton of value in it maybe, um, but it's just like, if you had to pick one team of the top eight seeds with the fewest flaws and the best odds of getting to a final four, Houston would be my pick, like hands down. Yeah, I think that's a great shout. And, um, you know, some years uh, you have a little bit of hesitancy to get involved with a team like Houston because, number one, like their margin for error is pretty low. They don't get to, f- to the free throw line a lot. They play very, very slow. So if they run into just a, an elite team that's shooting well from three on a given night, they might be in a little bit of trouble. Um, but that said, there's no elite teams. They are the yeah. elite team. <laughs> they yeah. They're the closest are. thing they have, the, right? Yeah. Right. And, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the tournament committee, the seating committee does some funny things with, you know, some of the, uh, you know, non-power fives, you know, that deserve one seeds. Like 
I could see them not getting necessarily the most friendly path. Um, but that said, they should absolutely be in the mix for a Final Four. And, um, you know, that so many of the other teams that are kind of right at the top of the standings have clear, clear, clear flaws. And you really just can't find one with Houston. So uh, yeah. don't uh, would not out in any way doubt them from getting to the uh, Final Four. Uh, the number two team right now in terms of just overall statistical ranking is Alabama. And I do not feel the same way about Alabama. Alabama looks like sort of your classic could get upset early type of team because they just cannot force turnovers. And at least when I look at sort of trying to handicap teams overall through the lens of, you know, statistics, I am deathly scared of high ranked teams that can't create turnovers because, you know, that's the way you get back into a game if you're down. Uh, and so, you know, that sort of the clear Achilles heel I see with Alabama, but then at the same time, like this is just an absolutely elite unit athletically, they play fast, uh, and, uh, boy, oh boy, do they do good job defending the two, uh, pretty well. So, um, they do have some characteristics that would kind of put them in the conversation, but, uh, is it fair to kind of hold it against them that they're not really creating turnovers? Yeah, I, I think so. And I think that, that goes to, um, the fear of an upset a little bit with if they're not playing particularly well on the offensive end for whatever reason, like it doesn't happen very often, but say Brandon Miller catches a guy who is, you know, a, a, you know, a a leaky black, right? Like a good wing defender who's locked in for the tournament. He could struggle. And if he struggles and Alabama's offense gets a little bit more cramped, their three point shooting isn't great outside of him. Uh, They can start forcing things up a little bit. And yeah, you're right. On the opposite end, their defense is solid in a lot of ways. They protect the rim. Um, they're good first shot defenders. But can you change the terms of engagement with your defense if you're losing, if you're struggling, if you're playing a really good point guard who controls a game um, in, in the NCAA tournament and just everything is slowed down a little bit more and, and offensive possessions are um, you know, a little bit more deliberate? Can you change how that game is going to go? And I, I agree with you that there's flaws there. I think, honestly, the biggest thing is they just need – two really young players to play really well. And if they don't, I think they're kind of relying besides Mark Spears, Mark Sears, I think they're kind of relying on Javon Quinterly who all season, you know, despite having some really good tournament performances in the past and really last year, the team was kind of built around him in a lot of ways mm-hmm. has gone to the bench this year and has not performed well, really consistently at all has had a couple of decent games, but by and large, every time I watch Javon Quinterly, I'm like, man, what's going on with Javon Quinterly. I think if they had him as sort of a sixth man, microwave type of guy like I think they were probably expecting coming into the year then it's a little bit different because he's a guy who can change the game at, at his best both on on both ends of the floor really with steals and deflections and, and scoring on the offensive end but they haven't really had that this year so yeah it's a it's a really good team I mean they're going to probably be a number one seed for a reason but if we're nitpicking flaws going down the line here um, they're a team with flaws both in, in terms of like do I trust these freshman guys Brandon Miller and Noah Clowney guys who, who kind of have to you know Miller can hold the ball a little bit but but can he um, if he gets stuck off the ball uh, against a good defensive team, can Alabama still score? There's there's issues there that you can definitely pinpoint. I mean, let's uh, hit on Purdue, uh, one of the weirder teams at the moment. Uh, upset last night. They've lost three of their past four. The market still has them as the second favorite overall for the title. Now looking at Ken Palm ratings, they're down to sixth. Um, how real do you think the slide is from Purdue? Well, I think it's tough. I mean, I think it's it's real in that their offense has clearly slowed down a little bit. I mean, they were putting up elite, elite offensive numbers early in the year. I think teams have probably sussed them a little bit in that uh, there are a couple guys that you can hang away from on the offensive end and that you kind of have to hang away from their freshman guards were the, a huge driver. Like obviously everything revolves around Zach Eady. He's the best player in the country. Um, he's putting up ridiculous single season numbers, like ridiculous, ridiculous. But the, the thing that's really powered them, everyone knew he was going to be good, at, at least pretty good, um, if you extrapolated his, you know, his per 40 averages out from you know, him playing as a, as a platoon big for the last two seasons. Like, it was safe to assume he was going to have a good season. He's exceeded that. But what really fueled them was Foster Lawyer and, and, uh, and Braden Smith, their freshman guards, who came in right away, just torched Marquette, West Virginia, Gonzaga, Duke early in the seasons, really good teams. People did not see them coming, and they were way better than expected relative to their recruiting rankings, fit in perfectly with this offense. Everything worked. That's hard to do. They're playing big minutes every night, right? Uh, Purdue has Mm -hmm. some guard depth, but those guys play a lot. They're 
I wouldn't describe them as the most like physically robust freshmen. And I think playing in the Big Ten on a nightly basis, uh, having the ball in your hands constantly uh, is the thing that kind of catches up on you. And maybe that in the tournament you worry about that less. Um, but I think clearly if you look at the balance of their offense, generally speaking, they've still gotten great stuff from Zach Eady. You look at the game in Indiana, he was phenomenal in that game, playing against Trace Jackson Davis, who is probably the second best player in the country. Um, but they didn't get what they needed elsewhere on the floor. Uh, they didn't get the stops they needed, and they've been a little shaky defensively here and there. Um, if Edie gets in foul trouble, then you really do worry about them, and you worry about kind of those the, the robustness of those guards to play against guys who are 22, 23 years old now in college basketball. Um, it's really hard to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm a little disappointed at the slide for Purdue lately, not because I was backing them or incited to back them, but the opposite. Like, I feel like people are on to – sort of the potential for this team to let down. Uh, they peaked a little too early in the season. There's a little bit of a roadmap like you kind of laid out on how to beat these guys. Uh, so what we're going to cheer for, Purdue, go win the Big Ten tournament. Let everyone forget about uh, kind of this uh, little late season swoon here. Um, and Because people will talk themselves into Purdue making a run just on the basis of, well, they have the best player. Like people look, you know, come out of the cut them out of the woodwork and they look at handicapping the tournament like, NBA and they're like well if you have the best player you're obviously going to go deep into the tournament um, but in reality they have a lot of the same issues that Alabama has can't really create turnovers now some of that might be playing in the Big Ten there's just a lot of really good ball security teams in the Big Ten but um, flashing red lights with the slow pace of play and, and the lack of creating turnovers so um, is there anyone else in sort of the uh, top eight right now that you would have on fade watch when it comes to uh, kind of living up to the expectation I mean the thing is, is that th this is where we are this season in college basketball, right? Is that all of these, <laughs> like all of these teams have like, like that's the reason why I said Houston. It's like, it's the most obvious thing, right? Like I'm not, I feel bad because I'm not like offering anybody some like searing insight there, but it, just writing about these teams every week, doing power rankings and, and taking a lot of statistical aspects into mind, but also the narrative of these teams. It's just like, I mean, Tennessee, let's, let's put Tennessee there. Like, I think Bart still has the Bart Torvik's uh, projection still has them as a potential number one seed. Um, that is a team that like, if they, you know, they are in incredibly good defensively, right? Like you saw it against Alabama this week, took Alabama out of all of the really difficult to guard stuff that Alabama does. One-on-one uh, -on -one defending across the five positions is like elite, elite, um, can stop anybody, can, can shut any team down on any given night. But uh, physically wise, defensively, the one flaw is they, they probably they could get into a game where they just get called for a lot of fouls, depending on who the refs are. And then they're sending people to the free throw line. And that's kind of the identity of their defense is they just play super physically. But also they can just go totally missing offensively. I mean, they beat Auburn a couple weeks ago to, to basically prevent, a, a, you know, if they hadn't won this game, they would have lost four games in a row. Their win against Auburn was 46 to 43. And it's just like most games that you know you're not going to win. And if that happens to you in the tournament, you're going home and you could be going home like in the first round, right? Like against if, if you play that, that offensively in the first round against a 15 seed, you can get beat. So they're very scary in that they guard really well, but like you really don't want any, uh, uh, I personally wouldn't want any big chunk of a team. That's like any given night, these guys can put up, 40 points and 55 possessions. Like, no, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, let's jump to the next tier teams projected the three to five seed range. I want to start off with UConn who uh, I have a big bet on UConn to win the big ace. That's going fantastically completely dead <laughs> in the water. Uh, I mean, to me, they're the strangest team just in that the results have been so underwhelming. Eight, seven in conference play went through a stretch where they lost five out of six, but still, Rated by Ken Palm as you know one of the five best teams um, in the country on on talent and underlying numbers. So, what do you make of UConn? Yeah, you know it's they, you're right. They are one of the trickier teams. I think um, performances have probably exceeded results for them. I think generally speaking, I think oh. uh, I'm looking at them lately as. Um, maybe kind of getting back closer to where they were in the season. Like they definitely had a, had a spell where they just weren't very good and they got into competition against Big East teams. And all of a sudden, you know, the Ed Cooley's and Sean Miller's of the world had something for them scout wise and, and um, defensively that they hadn't really seen. It wasn't as easy for them as when they were just kind of getting up and down the floor and, 
and and punishing people in the in the PK eighty and, and really shooting the ball well, getting lots of open shots. Everybody's playing a ton of minutes. Like, um, I think UConn lately looks a little bit better to me. Obviously, they lost at Creighton last Saturday, but that Creighton team's really good. And I like if you lose by three at Creighton, I'm kind of not bothered by it. It's some of the earlier results, like um, that midseason swoon where they lost a few games to good teams on the road and then lost at home to St. John's, and you're just like you know, they're, what What were they at the time? Like five and five and they're four and five in the big East. And it's, you know, their fans are freaking out and it's, you know, Danny Hurley still hasn't won a tournament game and all this stuff is like all flying around all of a sudden from um, their emotional peak a few weeks earlier. I think they're getting back to a level that speaks to where Ken Palm still has them ranked. Obviously their non-conference performance was really, really high level. I'd say like that's probably here and they were here in January. If they're like right here, then yeah, they can make a deep run in the tournament. There's a ton of depth. They're shooting there. If they can um, sort of put it in the right positions, uh, they have two really good big guys that they can rotate with, with Sonogo and cling in that um, kind of reminds me of Purdue a little bit in, in recent mm-hmm. seasons. Um, obviously Purdue didn't make tournament runs in, in, in those seasons, but uh, that's not, you know, they, they have, real talent and if they guard like they're they're a very difficult team to beat but i don't know that they are as good as they looked in november and december that's for sure okay that's that's completely fair and i i'm i will support connecticut we see what their draw is just because of the underlying talent uh you know the the only red light for them is at this point there's been too many guys to the free throw line and you know that's something that's fixable coachable so we'll see but um you know what i kind of noticed as i was looking at projected seedings and there's a lot of these out there now they're all pretty kind of in step and they all have to throw a little bit of shade at the west coast team which takes you know i take that personally i'm a west coast guy um, you know, among sort of the three to five uh, seed teams like UCLA, Arizona, Gonzaga, St. Mary's, uh, and one of those four really stand out to you as, uh, you know, having sort of the makeup and, the, um, uh, you know, the sort of the team signature of uh, being a little bit underrated come uh, come tournament time? Yeah, I think UCLA, I mean, UCLA would be the inciting one for me. Like, you know, Ken Palm still has them third. Um, they've continued to get better. They had a couple second. I mean, really what, what separates them right now from being unbeaten since November when they lost to Illinois and Baylor is two second half performances that were pretty uncharacteristic uh, at Arizona and at USC, both of which you can kind of like, "Eh, it's tough, you know, Arizona, obviously USC is not, not half bad this year. Um, They made a few shots in the second half of that game that kind of, built a, a big lead against UCLA and it's a rivalry game and kind of stuff happens. Um, but there are those two second half performances in both of those games from being unbeaten since November top five per possession defense. I think they're up to third or second. The last I checked, I mean, they are um, very, very good of, of sort of a classic Mick Cronin team in terms of defense, which they haven't been the last couple of years. You know, that team that went to the final four or got there by hitting a bunch of difficult shots in the tournament. Um, and then last year they were pretty balanced, but a more skilled offensive team. I think this year's defense, this year's defense, like it's very much a defense first team. Hawkes is a defense first player. Um, Jalen Clark might be the best defensive player in the country. And their sort of makeup is great defense, play super hard, and have some talent on the offensive end that Cronin never had when he coached at Cincinnati, when his teams would be ranked in like the fifties or sixties offensively and, and be, you know, best in the country defensively. So yeah, I think UCLA is probably a little underrated. Like if they're, um, you know, per Bart's projections, like if they're like a three seed right now, um, that's a little low relative to where the models have them. And, and sort of like looking at UConn, if you think UConn is, is closer to where they are in, in ter- sort of Kempom rankings relative to seed, UCLA would be one where maybe there's not as big of a margin there, but it's like they're still probably underrated based on their schedule not being great, but their performance on the floor being better than than maybe the the seeds give them credit for. Yep, that makes sense. All right, before we talk about some of the Blue Blood programs, just a reminder, if you don't have the NBC Sports Predictor app, go download it now. The contests are free and easy to play, and you have a shot to win thousands this weekend by predicting what will happen in the Premier League and college basketball. All right, let's talk about Duke, North Carolina, and Kentucky. Uh, Duke and Kentucky are 14 to 1 to make the final four. North Carolina uh, is 12 to 1. Uh, is there any of these three teams, Eamon, that you think is particularly poised to potentially spring some upsets? 
I mean, I think we can get to North Carolina and Kentucky. They're they're their own unique um, messes. But Duke actually, I think, is looking interesting in that um, they're obviously very young. I think their rate of improvement probably has a chance to accelerate now. Um, I saw them last Saturday against Virginia in person. And while they weren't great, um, they definitely present some challenges, particularly with Lively back. You know, he missed much of the season with injury. Uh, Kyle Filipowski and Ryan Young were their two bigs. And Ryan Young, bless his heart, is is not a Duke center um, at an elite level. <laughs> you see, you see, let's, that's putting it politely. Um, does some good stuff. He's a really good rebounder, but like, you know, not dynamic in the way that like uh, a five star Duke center like like lively can be and you see them on the floor with lively on the floor now and you're like okay this looks like a duke team like this is a talented group of guys um tyrese proctor is probably still a little young in terms of point guard but he did some really good stuff against virginia and ball screens sort of uh, his reads on ball screens are really good now he hesitates uh, Derek whitehead hit had a stretch where he had 10 straight points a couple corner threes that were basically created by proctor having now figured out how to play at the pace of college basketball hold defenders in their spots and then make the passes that he needs to make. So I was actually kind of impressed with Duke in that, you know, they've been banged up for a lot of the year. They haven't had their full sort of like squad and rotation um, in the mix in the same way that Shire would have wanted to, if he had his ideal world of kind of bringing them all along together. And I think now they're getting closer to that. So, um, you know, they're, they're, they have a better resume. They're not going to be freaking out the rest of the season, trying to get in the tournament. I don't think um, they're still very young, but they're the kind of team that, uh, I think if, like I said earlier, if their rate of improvement continues kind of as it has the last couple of weeks as, as they've gotten everybody healthy, there's a lot of talent on that team, just a lot of, of talent and it's young talent and college basketball is a little different than it was five years ago where you took all the best freshmen and, and went and tried to win the national title. But they're a team that I think if they get hot, uh, put some things together, they could make a tournament run for sure. Two quick uh, questions, follow up on Duke. Uh, if I'm a Duke fan, what, uh, you know, I am, let's say we get, we do well enough in the ACC tournament to warrant like a four seed. Like who's the one that I want to be matched up against. And then second kind of question, follow up. What, what do you, kind of grade do you give John Shire for his performance in year one as a coach? Well, it's, I mean, the thing is, the thing is, it's, it's for Shire. I'll, I'll go first. It's really hard to say. I, you talk to other, other coaches, um, ACC coaches, and he gets a, a really high level of praise, like for how they run their stuff, for how prepared his guys are. I mean, Tony Bennett was extremely enthusiastic about him. And it was interesting to listen to Tony Bennett talk to him, talk about him after the Virginia game, because it was like the kind of thing that like Shashevsky and Bayheim, and like every time they'd play Virginia early in Tony Bennett's tenure, it was like, man, this guy's a really good coach. You know, like they always, there was always that comment during their post game press conferences, like, wow, Virginia, like how well coached they are. Um, and so there was, it was funny to kind of see Bennett now making those comments about another guy. So it seems like he has the respect of his peers and is, a uh, um, like well-regarded within the game, but you know, it's, it's early. I mean, he's still in his, his, his thirties and he is, um, one of the youngest coaches in college basketball. I would assume that even he would admit that he's nowhere near fully formed yet. I think the biggest thing that's difficult to judge with him this year is it's just, They've they've been hurt for a lot of the year, and their roster is fine when guys like Lively are hurt. But uh, it's really only recently that they've gotten it back together. And I thought they've looked a lot more, kind of like I said, like a team that can that can make it a, a deep run. I mean, you know, they're you you asked if they're what if they end up being like a four seed? Well, four or five. I, I, I'm I'm envisioning them running the table here, winning the ACC, and getting like a four or five seed. I mean, I'm, no, I'm, I'm just I'm just a, I'm just a, a realistic fan, though. So you know, I see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. I mean, you know, the the twelve seeds of the world. Um, I honestly, I don't think there's like a a particularly scary twelve seed out there. I'm kind of looking right now, like. Um, I mean, as long as it's not uh, North Carolina or Kentucky, whoever gets out of whoever gets out of the first four, um, that would be funny. But I don't think it's particularly likely. I mean, look, there, you know, if Mississippi State stays down there, that could be tricky because that's a big physical team that will that will take away a lot of what Duke wants to do on the offensive end. Um, but you know, the thing with Duke again, there, I don't think they're fully formed yet. I don't think they are where they're going to end up. And so um, how they look on, and, and I'm, I'm not saying this at all, but if people remember the 2014-15 team, 
that team couldn't guard the entire year. Yeah. And then it got into the NCAA tournament, and all of a sudden they were clicking defensively and flying around and creating steals and guarding the best teams in college basketball, um, guarding that Wisconsin offense in the national title game. Um, I don't think we're going to see like a Coach K masterclass coming this season in that same way, but they have the talent at at their level to uh, be much better than they have been for for much of the season. I, I think that's fair enough. Uh, I mean, you mentioned the the two messes of UNC and Kentucky. Is there a mess between those two that you think is more salvageable? Probably UNC, just because I think, um, you know, look, I I was. I was out on that team last February, and then obviously they <laughs> proved everyone wrong, and I kind of ended up um, catching a lot of heat from ACC fans with the way the the tournament played out um, after just clearing the conference dead, like in mid February or whatever. But um, yeah, I, I guess UNC, uh, just because I think if they can get hot, get Pete Nance playing semi well, there's a chance they can put something at a much lower level together the way they did last year. I don't think they're they're at much risk of going to the Final Four again. Um, the makeup of the team, despite being so similar, you look at their actual output and like what shots guys are getting and how Caleb Love is approaching the game of basketball this season, and it's just not the same um, output from from pretty similar players. It's kind of weird, and Armando Baycott being you know, struggling with injuries here and there has not been helpful either. Um, Kentucky is really interesting because I was high on them coming into the year. Uh, they have a raw, they have a lineup that, um, you know, with case on Wallace uh, Reeves, CJ Frederick Toppin and Shibwe that ranks among the best lineups uh, in, in terms of net rating in the sec. And it's pretty high up in college basketball, but I don't think it, I think it's played like 83 minutes together all year. Mm -hmm. And that's typical sort of John Calipari stubbornness of like what he wants from his teams, where they get their shots. Like he's still all in on long twos in the year 2023. Um, they don't shoot enough threes despite having Frederick and Reeves. Um, and so I, unless some of that stuff changes, uh, given some of their injuries that they've had here and there as well, it's hard for me to see Kentucky being good enough, particularly defensively, particularly with Oscar Shibway on the floor, who's really struggled in pick and rolls and people have picked on him all year uh, to imagine them making a deep run. But, but we are in a place where like one of those, th those two teams could play in the first four, Kentucky, North Carolina, which the tickets in Dayton would be hilariously expensive. And, <laughs> and, and you'd, you'd be at risk of one of those teams getting out of the first four and being that first four team that every year goes on like a sweet 16 run. Um, which would be funny as well. But but right now, both of those teams are messes in their own unique way. Yeah, that makes sense to me. All right, before we get into some of the key Saturday games, a reminder to download the Roto World app to receive breaking player news all season long. Stay ahead of the competition by favoriting players on your roster. Get the latest injury updates, player news, and much more delivered right to your phone. It's available in the App Store today. Now, Eamon, selfishly, the game I want to start with is in the Big 12, Baylor at Kansas. Yeah. The projected line is Kansas minus four. I have a big position on Texas being the regular season uh, conference winner in the Big 12. Uh, so I don't really know what I'm even cheering for in this game, given these are the biggest <laughs> threats. But what do you make of Baylor at Kansas? Yeah, I was going to say, you just made me pull up the Big 12 standings to make sure I wasn't um, mistaken that they're all still tied at nine and four. I mean... It is that it is that kind of season uh, in the Big 12 where, like, you know, I think these top three teams have separated themselves now, but but everybody Ooh. loses pretty regularly. I think um, I expect Kansas to win pretty much every game they play at home. Uh, yeah. Like, it's just it's incredibly to anybody who's ever been there can tell you it's an incredibly difficult place to play. Uh, Baylor has managed it. <sighs> a couple of times in Scott Drew's tenure and considering how good they've been for like the last decade kind of tells you um, how difficult it is. Like they've been the best other big 12 team for most of the past 10 years. And they very occasionally have won there. Um, you know, I, the, the, I think Kansas is as long as like Baylor's offense has been playing great, great, great. Um, not as good defensively, although they're getting there a little bit. I expect Kansas to handle basically handle things on both both sides and get like that standard three to you know three point bump that they get from playing at home and, and be fairly comfortable with it yeah that makes sense they got a tough they got a tough home stretch here they're looking like they may be dogs on the road against tcu dogs on the road to close the season against texas if they don't get this win against baylor then you can pretty much write them off of a big 12 title but um that is absolutely the best game of the weekend um how about uh, any interest in um you know what we would expect for 
from the Big Ten, who we didn't really give a lot of shine to on this podcast, mostly because I can't really uh, stomach a lot of Big Ten basketball personally. Um, but uh, there's a couple of good games. Rutgers, Wisconsin right now, kind of going to hover right around a pick maybe small edge to Rutgers. Uh, Michigan State, Michigan is always a fun interstate rivalry. Another one hovering right around a pick um, You know, what's sort of the strategy for handicap in the Big Ten right now in either of these games? Do you think there's an edge uh, considering matchups? Yeah, you know, I I don't know. I think the Michigan State Michigan game the kind of interesting thing there is like um and I hate to to bring this into like a, you know, what is otherwise a relatively um uh silly like conversation, but like are are Michigan State's kids like ready to play basketball right now? Um like I I feel like that's a a quick thing to turn around and or maybe they're like, you know, with Tom Izzo and how he spoke this week like um, maybe that's just kind of behind them or they're galvanized by it. But that's a tricky, like, human element thing that that may factor in there. I think um, Michigan is, like, a, a better than their record by a long way. Um, but I don't think that they are – they have lacked the ability to finish games all season. And I think – I don't think it's just, like, luck in close games. I think it's a personnel thing. Um, I don't think they take good shots down the stretch. I've seen Juwan Howard walk off in frustration to go shake an opposing coach's hand. Uh, after like his drawn up last possession is not executed well far too many times this season. Um, so I think there is a very decent chance that they, uh, that, that Michigan state sneaks out of there with like, um, you know, wins by a bucket or whatever, but I can, I could just picture Juan Howard having called up a play, um, in the last 30 seconds, not getting exactly what the team wants and it going back iron and, and, uh, Michigan state running out of the gym with a, with a win Rutgers at Wisconsin. Like I'm, I'm kind of. Um, confused by Wisconsin, their numbers um, continue to be like they're on the tournament bubble for sure. And we're tracking them every week, but they don't look much like a tournament team, particularly on the offensive end, at least to me, I think they're, uh, they're really rough. And I think you throw in Rutgers defense, which has been a little bit shakier the last couple of weeks, but um, has been most of the season, one of the best two or three defensive teams in the country. Uh, you know, you could you could see them holding Wisconsin to a to a cool forty five or something here. So um, I like both of those. I like I like both I like both of those road teams. Um, if only if only narrowly. I like under so so I'll circle under a hundred for Wisconsin uh, Rutgers. And you brought up that other game that went under a hundred. I was watching that at a bar uh, skiing uh, the the week before the Super Bowl, and I was like, oh man, how is this game still in the first half? I'm like, what t- times wind down. Oh, oh, this is the second half. <laughs> <It's> coming, <laughs> yeah, yeah. that was that. That was Auburn, Tennessee, I guess. But yeah, yeah. Uh, good, good year for defense in college basketball. It is indeed. All right, well, Eamon, thanks so much for joining. I know for myself, when I close my eyes, I still see James Bradbury holding Juju Smith Schuster. My mind is still in football <laughs> mode. So I appreciate all the info that you've given out. Help that transition as we head into the college basketball, really being front and center of everything. So, can you let people know? Uh, where to follow you and uh, and where to find your content. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm at Eamon Brennan on Twitter. It's right there and um, on the screen. And uh, I'm over at um, The Athletic. Uh, we write about college basketball more and with more quality, I would say, than just about anybody in the world. And this week especially, we had a huge content blitz uh, for people coming in after, <laughs> after the Super Bowl. Um, and so go over and check that out. Subscribe. Uh, subscribe to one of my stories so I get credit for it. And uh, enjoy. Awesome. Thanks, Simon. And, uh, and good luck on the weekend. Likewise. Cool. All right. College basketball, Drew. It's all happening. Shift the, uh, sh- shift the old brain uh, into that <laughs> mode. Still, uh, yeah, I'm still, I don't know if you're the same, but like after the Super Bowl, my first thing in terms of like when I wake up and I'm checking markets, I'm like, oh, wonder if there's been any movement in next year's Super Bowl market. <laughs> uh, some bets to make there, but yeah. uh, what uh, no. what are you looking at for the weekend? Yeah, well, you know, we're both doing a little traveling right now. And, um, you know, you spend time on a plane, you got to load up the podcasts, right? And uh, it was a tough question. Like, what, what direction do I go here? Because if you go hard NBA, 
we're going right into the all-star break. There's nothing actionable you're going to get out of NBA content this weekend. Um, and so I'm, I'm mostly focusing on the country club sports. Uh, decent start for me in, uh, at the Genesis uh, in Riviera or at Riviera. And, uh, yeah, pulling for Tommy Fleetwood there, Max Homa, Sanjay M. Uh, if those guys can, if the, if Max Homa and Sanjay M can get into the top 20, I'm going to be green for the tournament. If uh, Tommy Fleetwood can somehow get his nose in to uh, threaten to win that tournament, then, uh, then, you know, we may, we may be, I'll, I'll fly out and see you in Vegas because it's going to be a big weekend. So, uh, you know, che- cheering for some golf and then of course, uh, you know, trying to collect some data in the tennis world because, uh, Indian Wells is right around the corner, just like March Madness. Yep. All happening there. Uh, last night, Drew, uh, it's kind of wrapped up after dinner. A lot of people hit the tables as you do um, in Las Vegas. Uh, and I decided not to join them because I wanted to go over to a kiosk and check out the defensive player of the year odds <laughs> and uh, spend my time <laughs> spending a good 30 minutes scrolling through uh, the, the bevy of uh, futures options available in Las Vegas. Uh, so Anyone have any draft up? props up? No, it's just number one overall pick, really. And Bryce Young is still Ooh. minus 120. Do you ever read on that market? Do you, do you think that there's any chance that, like, I've been told that the best outsider bet, the guy who could come from the clouds, is if the Colts trade up for one and they might have an interest in Will Levis, um, who yeah. is around 10 to 1 or so. But any, anyone you like in, in that market? Um, well, I mean... It- you have we have to figure out who's going to end up getting the pick. Colts do seem like the obvious suitor. Jimmers is saying it, <laughs> but and who they end up selecting, uh, you know, I mean, clearly Chris Ballard has sort of a, a general kind of uh, archetype that he likes to, you know, he wants his quarterback to be a certain way. You can look at it in terms of who he's acquired, um, and uh, you know, that would fit more of the archetype of a Will Lovis than it would a, uh, you know, a Stroud or a, a Bryce Young. But the people who have kind of broken down the film and you know, kind of you know make a case for Bryce Young outside of size which can be fixed in the NFL like I don't know if you know this but plenty of guys come in too small Joe Burrow was one of them um you know there's there's definitely uh you know a way to uh, address that and if you have a brain like you know Bryce Young does for playing the quarterback position then that's kind of unteachable so um he would be my pick but uh I do think love us of the choices as outsiders uh, is the only one I would take a swing on Yep, that makes sense. Um, before we close off, a couple of things I've bet the past couple of days. Uh, despite injuring his wrist last night, Giannis being 30 to 1 for Defensive Player of the Year is still ridiculous. They're, they're 0.3 points off having the number one defense. Brooke Lopez, I don't think, is going to be the candidate. Giannis's, Giannis's defensive stats across the board now, all the advanced numbers, their D rating when he's on the court, the on off. Uh, Estimated plus minus is all skewing in Giannis's direction, and also he's just better at defense than Brook Lopez. I'm sorry, <laughs> which well. matters. <laughs> yeah, which kind of does matter. Um, so I think thirty to one is a ridiculous price. I think that should be more like six to one. So long as it doesn't come out today that he's actually broken his wrist, I'm treating that as like it's a normal <laughs> wrist sprain, which is usually you're out a week, and he, he probably miss maybe misses one game after the break, if at all. So. That's my best uh, best bet at the moment. And then yeah. talked about it on on yesterday's show, um, but there's a couple of Premier League futures bets that I like. Uh, Brighton to finish in the top four is plus 850. Uh, I think that is way too big. And then uh, Everton to finish bottom is uh, plus 800, which I also think is too big. All right. Don't forget to check out NBCSportsEdge.com for more information to help you with your wages. Thanks for those watching us on the NBC Sports YouTube channel. And if you're listening to us in podcast form, don't forget to subscribe and rate us from me in Nevada and Drew in Oregon. Have a great weekend. Good luck with your bets and we'll see you on Monday.